Well, good morning, church. The title of our message today is A Nation of Cowards. A Nation of Cowards. I did an image, image search on DuckDuckGo.com. You know, instead of using Google, where it tracks you, I use DuckDuckGo. It's kind of such a strange name, you always remember it. I did an image search. You can search for images to see what image comes out when you put in a certain word. So I put in the word coward or cowardice and searched just to see what image would come up. And I thought maybe there'd be some image that would come up that would sort of be common, a common image that sort of is a common one for fear. There was a couple white flags and this and that, but there was nothing that really stood out uh, generally, but there was one which was sort of contraintuitive. There was one near the top of the list that was helpful. Some of you will remember this image. It's a picture of a Chinese man standing in front of a column of tanks in Tiananmen Square. You remember that? Some of you might remember it. It was 1989. It's estimated that a million persons were protesting government repression in China. A column of tanks was advancing into Tiananmen Square to uh, break up the protest. You know, got a million, a million people protesting, that's, that's it's kind of challenging. A man ran out there and he stood in front of this oncoming T-59 tank and other tanks right behind it. You remember that picture? That was, you know, sure death. But what happened was, the coal column of tanks stopped right there. And then the tr tanks doing this thing, trying to go around the guy, and he would move in front of it and, and get in front of the tank. And everything stopped. The tank driver tried to go around him, and he continued to stand defiantly in front of the tanks for some time. Then he finally climbed onto the turret of the tank to talk to the soldiers inside. And then he got out and tried to move some more, and he stood in front of the tanks, and then some friends came in and dragged him into the crowd. And nobody even knows his name. They just call him the tank man. Apparently he lived through that, and he's presumably maybe still alive today the tank man. Sometimes we best clarify what one thing is by another thing. Cowardice is the opposite of courage, and courage is the opposite of cowardice. What does it take to make a nation of cowards? I won't be pointing my finger at you. I won't be claiming to be the only righteous person standing. I do want to explore with you a little bit about fear and cowardice in the context of Revelation 13. We've understood the lamb-like, dragon-like beast to represent there in Revelation 13, verse 11, to represent the United States of America under the influence of an apostate Protestantism. And I believe that in this we are correct. But there are two possibilities for how this nation could become that. Right? Two possibilities. Either, number one, we were never what we thought ourselves to be. Or number two, this nation passes through a change and becomes what we were not. I want to propose to you that while it is true that we rarely live up to our highest expectations, I think that's true. And so in a sense, America never really quite as was what we fully claimed to be, what we, that we were what we wanted to be. I think there's a, there's a truth to that. But I want to say that the larger part of the answer is that America, it's number two, America changes. Possibility number two is more descriptive of what happens 
than possibility number one. None of us want to be a coward or be accused of being a coward. None of us want to be selfish or be accused of being selfish. We want to be a right example to others, self-sacrificing, unselfish. And you know what? We want to be heroic. But if the United States starts out supporting our God-given rights and in the end denies God-given rights, that tells us something Something somewhere goes catastrophically wrong. How could the baseline principles of a nation, how could you change those? How could that even happen? Now there's something in us, there's something in all of us, there's something fallen and self-serving. You know that real cowardice will always be self-service. All of us are well-trained in self-service. And so then it's an easy thing for us to slip into cowardice. Cowardice apparently delays testing, but it manifests exactly during a test. So what I want to do is look with you now at some Bible insights on this, and then we're going to go and look at some things from the, a book that's on your shelf called The Great Controversy, and then we'll finally conclude with one last thought. But I want to look at some Bible testings. You see, the history of God's people is a history of their testings. We have been warned against following the crowd. Most of the time, following the crowd leads us into this I'm going to say it into this subhuman behavior. Turn to Exodus 23. Exodus 23. In Exodus, God gives the warning. Exodus 23, verses 1 and 2. Here it is. You shall not circulate a false report. Do not Put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. You shall not. Then there's always Numbers 14 and the spies. Remember that? Twelve people, twelve scouts go. They look at the land. You know the story. We just talked about it not long ago. They return. They give their report. And virtually the whole people turn into a murderous mob. Remember, Numbers 14, verse 2. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. How many of them complained? It was pretty much all of them, right? And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, if, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if, if only we had died in this wilderness. And then if you go to verse 10, you know, Moses and the leaders, they're on their knees praying in front of the congregation, and it says in verse 10, and all the congregation said, stone them with stones. And they began to pick up stones, you know. And that was when God did an intervention. But basically, the whole of these people, Israel had crossed the desert. God delivered them from hundreds of years of bondage in Egypt. And now on, on the very borders of the promised land, now they snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Of course, then there's the famous or maybe infamous chapter in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 14. And you know those two stories, don't you? 1 Samuel 14. Israel and the Philistines are at war. Jonathan and his armor bearer demonstrate enormous courage. How? 
They, there's a pillar, and they climb up this pillar, and they kill a garrison of 20 Philistines up there. Two to 20. This kind of loosens everything up, so Saul sends the army out, and, and there's a melee, and lots of fighting. And Saul makes a rash oath there that no one is to eat until they've completed the battle. But Jonathan hadn't heard the oath. So in the middle of the fight, they're in the forest and they come upon a, a bee's nest and there's honey there and, and they're hungry and, you know. Jonathan eats some of the honey. So the people get faint because they're fighting. And finally they began to eat the, some of the plundered animals with the blood in them, which is wrong. So Saul stops everything, they make a big kosher meal, they all kind of begin to eat there, and then they want to, he wants to continue the battle, you know, let's finish routing the Philistines, so they say, well, let's consult God, and then God doesn't answer Saul, so Saul says, something's wrong, something, God's not answering, something's wrong, and he got down to figuring out how it was that something was wrong, and you know the rest of the story, don't you? He discovers that Jonathan has eaten the honey. And what does Saul say? He's ready to kill his own son, to kill Jonathan for transgressing his will. 1 Samuel 14. But in verse 45, pay close attention to this. In verse 45, so the king's ready to kill Jonathan. What does it say in 45? But the people said to Saul, Shall Jonathan die who has accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. And then it says this, So the people, so the people rescued Jonathan that he did not die. Very interesting See, the king was only allowed to go as far in his madness as the people permitted. So they resisted his murderous rage and they saved Jonathan from an unjust death. And you know, the people will follow the crowd or they'll follow right. But the record for big crowds isn't very good most of the way. Revelation 13 tells us that this nation is an end time power. Verse 11 speaks as a dragon. Verse 12, it causes its people to engage in actions which constitute the equivalent of worship. Over there in verse 14, it tells the people to make an image. And up in verse 16, it finally causes some of the people to receive the mark. You know, that's a description of an enormous exercise of influence. How, how, how do a people, we're back to our question, how do a people abandon their principles? How is it that they change from a nation, you know, a nation of, of heroes to a nation of cowards? How do you do that? So, there's four paragraphs in the book, The Great Controversy. They all come at about page 591 and 592. They're in exactly the order. I'm going to go through them with you. Just four paragraphs. What I want to do is look at these four paragraphs, and we'll look at the paragraph, then we'll comment, then we'll go to the next paragraph and comment, and look at some things the Bible has to say, and I think, you know what, I think we'll get an answer. I think we'll get a Bible answer. Remember the title of our message today, and I don't like the title, A Nation of Cowards. All right, paragraph number one. 
God never. Boy, it's interesting when a paragraph begins that way. God never forces the will or the conscience. But, and it's interesting when a sentence continues that way, isn't it? All right, so here it is without interruption. God never forces the will or the conscience, but Satan's constant resort to gain control of those whom he cannot otherwise seduce is compulsion by cruelty. Through fear or force, he endeavors to rule the conscience and to secure homage to himself. To accomplish this, he works through both religious and secular authorities, moving them to the enforcement of human laws in defiance of the law of God. That's an interesting paragraph. So the point here is the satanic gaining of control over every individual, as many as he can, because this is the means by which the devils can destroy us. They want to get control. If they can obtain enough leverage to persuade us to do what? To violate conscience, they prevail. They're looking for that leverage. So we learn here that God, God never, that's an absolute, God never forces the will or the conscience. He will not force us to do something, nor will he force us to violate our conscience. If we have a correctly functioning conscience, God will work with it. He will not go against it or overpower it. God gave you a conscience. That's a gift to you and me. And God doesn't say, all right, things have gone too far now. I'm going to go around their conscience. God doesn't do that. But Satan. Satan will use compulsion, force, and one of the particular ways he uses force is through cruelty. Cruelty. And cruelty uh, through leading the individual to feel fear, through that he employs force after a sort. If he can make you afraid... He's got you. He doesn't want to reason with your conscience. His plan is to rule your conscience. And if we submit, we are, we are giving him homage, we are then choosing to worship him. That's what he wants. Satan works through both religious and secular authorities. He moves them to enforce human enactments, right? Now, some have very conveniently said that this rule or that rule, this requirement or that requirement, well, was not strictly speaking in vi a violation. It wasn't strictly speaking a violation of the law of God, so, so we should go ahead and obey it. Now, it is true that there is a significant difference between the Sabbath and God's law, and most other human enactments. There's a difference there, isn't there? But then please pause and think with me about someone you, we should all be very familiar with. His name is Daniel. Daniel. Daniel, chapter 1, Daniel sought to have the prescribed diet changed, right? Right? His managers were afraid to do that because Daniel 1, and you can look at it in verse 10. They had a reason. They weren't just arbitrarily or randomly uh, unhappy. They were afraid of a certain thing. In Daniel 1, verse 10, Daniel's manager said, Oh, no, we're not going to do that for you because it will endanger my neck. If Babylon, the Nebuchadnezzar, king, says, you're not looking too good. Who is going to pay the price? I will lose my life. 
my life is at risk. So no, you don't get to, you don't get, to get off on this. You're going to eat what we put in front of you. That's just the way it is. Now I have a question for you. Where in the Ten Commandments are the clean and unclean meats? Where are they? Well, some might say they're not there. So wasn't it selfish for Daniel and his friends to put the lives, the lives of others at risk just to avoid eating pork? And yet they did proceed. They did proceed, and in spite of this apparently actual risk to the manager, they went ahead and tried to get their diet changed. Oh, and by the way, remember, Nebuchadnezzar had a way of roasting people in the fire that he was unhappy with. So was that a realistic problem? If I disobey Nebuchadnezzar, I might be killed. I think that was a very realistic risk issue. Yes. But they did proceed. It wasn't a kind of high-handed and selfish of them. But then again, perhaps what they were doing was within the scope of the Ten Commandments. Because you remember, right? Like there's Ten Commandments there, but what's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. Now, possibly, they understood this to mean... We are not to disregard God's directions for what we are to eat and not eat because in doing so, we would be placing the requirements of the Babylonian government above the requirements of God. Possibly they looked at it that way. But then there's Daniel's behavior in chapter 6, which is even more extreme. Where, where does God's law require us to do like Daniel did? And to open our windows and pray toward Jerusalem three times a day. Someone might argue this, this was just a personal preference. You know, something that Daniel liked to do. Okay, why couldn't he just, just pray a little bit more quietly? Why couldn't he... Pray in his closet. The Bible talks about that. Why couldn't he pray in private? Why couldn't he avoid an unnecessary confrontation with the Babylonian government? Wasn't Daniel again engaging in selfish behavior? He could keep praying to the God of heaven, but just 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 not so much, not so much in public. The Ten Commandments did not require him to open his windows and give his enemies grist to destroy him, did they? But if you look at Daniel chapter 6, and you look at verse 10, we find out what Daniel did do. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. And here it is. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early Days. So, he unnecessarily earned himself a one-way ticket to the lion's den for a dinner date. Or was it unnecessary? Was it selfish? Or maybe this was a matter of faithfulness to God after all, even though it was only a temporary decree. I mean, this was a temporary thing. 30 days, right? To avoid controversy, can't we stop being quite so public just, just for a month? But Daniel openly violated even this temporary 
human law. Hmm. Well, I said there were four paragraphs. That's paragraph one. Let me read to you paragraph number two. Again, this is Great Controversy, page 591. Here's paragraph two. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. Their conscientious scruples will be pronounced obstinacy, stubbornness, and contempt of authority. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. Ministers who deny the obligation of the divine law will present from the pulpit the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authorities as ordained of God. In legislative halls and courts of justice, commandment keepers will be misrepresented and condemned. A false coloring will be given to their words. The worst construction will be put upon their motives. I'm telling you the future, ladies and gentlemen, because God told us the future. That's the future. And if you're faithful to Jesus, that's your future. So here it is. We will be denounced as enemies, not only of law, which I think, you know, we expect, but we will be denounced, and this might be harder for us, we will be denounced as enemies of order. We will be identified as the cause of moral decline. It's your fault. It's my fault. We will be claimed to be causing anarchy because we are a source of disorder. We are not doing what we're told. We are not obeying human decrees and rules and protocols and policies and mandates and whatever. It will be said that God is angry at the nation. Why? Because Adventists are breaking the rules somehow. That's what's going to be said. Believers in Jesus, however, will be people of conscientious scruples. Conscientious scruples. We will, yes, we will be out of harmony with various decrees. We will be seeking to be true to our conscience, but we will be charged with being stubborn, Stubborn. We will supposedly be in contempt for authority and disaffected toward the government. But I ask you, when the government usurps authority, that is, when the government takes to itself authorities which have not been granted it, is it obstinance to resist? Or are we within our rights when we elect not to submit to the government when the government acts outside of law. In fact, are we not then upholding law? Are we not then sustaining order? Or if we submit to bullying and usurpation, are we not exactly at that time failing morally, acting selfishly, encouraging the illegitimate exercise of authority? Are we not at that time doing moral harm to the bully? How? By joining him in the imagination that he's justified in acting outside of the law. Friend, are we not doing him moral harm when we submit to his illegitimate use of force? Now, because some minister claims that we're acting in contradiction to Christianity, does that mean we're acting in contradiction to Christianity? Does the Bible require us to cower and submit because someone is wearing a uniform or claiming they have authority? Let us suppose that Congress actually passes a law that is unconstitutional, and we disregard that law even though it has not been reviewed by the Supreme Court yet. But we say, no, that's not constitutional, and we say, we're not going to do that. Suppose that happens. Or, or, or even more, even this. Let's suppose that a law has been passed, and let's say it's gone to the, it's been tested in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, hey, this is a constitutional law. 
but let's say that that law violates God's commandments. So then there are nine men, in, or nine people in black robes. Presently, it's about six Catholics and three Jewish people. Are they our determinant of right and wrong? Experts. I don't think they are. Sorry, I don't think they are, friend. We can respect authorities. In fact, we should respect authorities. But we must obey the authority of God. And that means we must consult carefully the Bible and our conscience. I can tell you that even the Supreme Court, presently, as I said, a room mostly full of Catholics and Jews, not, not, I'm not, I don't hate Catholics and Jews, but they cannot be a Lord over my conscience. Jesus is Lord. Our duty is to God and everything else is a very, very distant second. Paragraph 3. Back to Great Controversy 591, paragraph 3. As the Protestant churches reject... Now, you know why we're doing this, because we're getting to the answer that we started with, the question we started with. So here's paragraph 3. As the Protestant churches reject the clear scriptural arguments in defense of God's law, they will long to silence those whose faith they cannot overthrow by the Bible. Though they blind their own eyes to the fact, they are now adopting a course which will lead to the persecution of those who conscientiously refuse to do what the rest of the Christian world are doing and acknowledge the claims of the papal Sabbath. That's paragraph three. So listen, did you hear what's coming? Clear scriptural arguments, defending obedience to God's law. And here I think we can be very clear that in Great Controversy 591, Sister White is talking right here about the seventh day Sabbath. Okay? That's what's in view. Now, these clear scriptural arguments will be presented. Now, who are they going to be presented by? Are they going to be presented by our religious liberty lawyers? Well, I, I hope some of them are. Will they be presented by pastors and famous speakers and your favorite speaker? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I, hope, I hope we do. Maybe. But you know what? We could be disappointed. Pastors and lawyers are people just like we are. All of us are susceptible to force and compulsion. And you know, the devils have a thousand arguments ready to persuade us that, you know what? You're being too definite. You're wrong. You need to stop and back up and you need to rethink this. You know, you're acting in your own self-interest. You're being selfish. And you know what? You're standing in the way of greater good. So basically, shut up and sit down, Mr. Preacher. And some of us might, in a moment, kind of be taken aback by that and maybe feel, well, you know, maybe I need to, maybe I'm all wrong. The devil doesn't really care. The devils just say, if I can get him to shut up for a couple minutes, that's all I need. So, yes, I hope that many of us present these arguments. But I believe it is most likely that some of the best arguments, the best use of clear scriptural arguments in support of God's truth, some of those, I believe, will be presented by simple men and women of faith. Right. Men and women, I might add, who have been arrested and detained on charges of disobeying laws or rules which come under color of law. You know, you're, that's why you're in the court, you know, de de defending your behavior, because you've been arrested, you've been detained. Boy, back in Babylon, there was a lot of Hebrew people that, when the music came in Daniel 3, what did they do? They bowed down right then and there. 
If Daniel and his friends, well, I don't know where Daniel was, but if Daniel's three friends had looked around and said, boy, look at all of our, all the other Hebrew people, they're bowing down, I guess, I guess, yeah. Well, I feel depressed, I guess we'll just bow down too. They have a different Bible. The people, the Adventists who give these messages, the believers in Jesus who give these messages, will be men and women who have been arrested or detained on charges of disobeying laws or rules which come under color of law. Now, here's a few lines you might find interesting from the Wikipedia entry on color of law. You've heard that phrase, haven't you? Color of law? Here's what Wikipedia says. In the United States law, the term color of law denotes the mere semblance of legal right, the pretense or appearance of right. Hence, an action done under color of law adjusts, or that is, it colors the law to the circumstance. Yet, said apparently legal action contravenes the law. Under color of authority is a legal phrase used in the United States indicating that a person is claiming or implying the acts he or she is committing are related to and legitimized by his or her role as an agent of governmental power, doing something under cover, color rather of law. That's how it is. You're arrested for something, and they say, well, that's not legal, so you're under arrest. Color of law. I would remind you again also that what Ellen White wrote about the fugitive slave laws, large laws which at the time were understood at the highest levels of government to be legitimate and authoritative laws in the United States. Do you know what Ellen White said? I'm going to read it to you. I was shown that we have men placed over us for rulers and laws to govern the people. Were it not for these laws, the world would be in a worse condition than it is now. Some of these laws are good and some bad. That's interesting. Well, let me continue the quotation. The bad have been increasing and we are yet to be brought into straight places. But God will sustain his people in being firm and living up to the principles of his word. Where the laws of men conflict with God's word and law, we are to obey the word and law of God, whatever the consequences may be. Now, here's the sentence. The, I'm continuing the quotation. The laws of our land requiring us to deliver a slave to his master, we are not to obey. And we must abide the consequences of the violation of this law. This slave is not the property of any man. God is his rightful master, and man has no right to take God's workmanship into his hands and claim, claim it as his own. And if you want the reference for that, it's Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4B, page 43. It's kind of an obscure reference. But what an interesting statement. She says, flat out, just as plain as can be, there are laws we are to disobey. Very interesting. What's that? Reference, uh, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4B, page 43. And finally, let's look at paragraph 4. There was four paragraphs. This paragraph is at the bottom of 591, and it goes over onto 592. This is the last of the four paragraphs. And by the way, the answer to the question we began with is explicitly given in this paragraph. So here we go. These are all exactly in order. So here's this one. The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade, or compel all classes to honor the Sunday. The lack of divine authority will be supplied by oppressive enactments. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Liberty of conscience which has cost so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected 
in the soon coming conflict, we shall see exemplified the prophet's words. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, Revelation 12, 17. So that's paragraph four. There will be, of course, no divine authority for the law to worship on Sunday. You've read the book. There's no divine authority for a law like that. And there won't be any that's found at the last moment in time either. So what's going to be? It's going to be an oppressive enactment. It's going to be a corrupt act. It'll be unjust and not in harmony with truth. Now here we see the answer to the question with which we began this exploration today. Remember that question. Was America never what we thought it was? Or is it more correct to understand that what is coming is that America will change what it is will transform. Which one is more correct? I think it's more correct to say that it will depart from lamb likeness and turn toward dragon likeness. So again, here's your answer. This sentence is your answer. And I just read it to you. Rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. So you see, there's a popular demand. Legislators, you know, who want to be elected and re-elected? They're going to look over the whole matter. They're going to put their little finger up in the air. And kind of give a weather check, you know. Which way is the wind blowing around here? And they're going to conclude that the way to achieve their personal desire, i.e. to be reelected, is to yield to popular demand. They're not asking whether it's constitutional. They're asking, what does it take around here to get reelected? But because many want something, maybe even a majority, does not mean it's right for them to have what they want. Even a supermajority, a two-thirds vote in parliamentary procedure, cannot override natural law. It cannot override what's right. Hey, even a 100% vote, even a unanimous 100% vote, cannot override God's law, God's ways, God's requirements. The very foundation of America is this double principle of civil and religious liberty. Those two principles set this nation apart. Our laws as a nation not only sustain the right of the majority, but hey, you better be glad they sustain the right of the minority. So we have about 535 legislators, I think that's correct, 100 senators and uh, 435 legislators. Maybe I'm off a couple numbers, but I think it's right. 535 legislators, all 535 could vote that the president can take your spouse from you and make her his second wife, and it would not be right, and God would not recognize it as right, because she's married to you, or he's married to you. Unanimous vote, 535 to zero, couldn't change what's right and wrong. Even our Constitution does not make rights for us. What it does is it, it recognizes pre-existing rights that all men are created equal and endowed by God with God-given rights to life, to liberty, to the pursuit of happiness. This is why the fugitive slave law was unjust. The law said, if you come upon someone who's run away from his master, you must return him or you will face the consequences. But that was unconstitutional and it was outside of God's will. It was an inhuman law. And we are to disobey that law, see? It's even more than unconstitutional. It was against the natural rights of every man. Every man receives his natural rights from heaven. How or why? Because he's human. Like Ellen White said, the black man's name is written in the book of life beside the white man's. All are one in Christ. Listen to this. Birth, station, nationality, or color 
cannot elevate or degrade men. The character makes the man. What a statement. I mean, that's as plain as it can get. Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 342. The black man's name is written in the book of life beside the white man's. It's because of Jesus. Friends, we must never forget that we are children of the king. His laws we are to follow, and everything else, everything else after that comes in a very distant second. We should seek peace. We should look for gentleness. We should be careful not to needlessly create friction, right? But God is God, and no one else is God. We are always his first, always. Well, friends, I said there was one last point before we conclude. And I don't often do this, but I'm going to quote from C.S. Lewis. I want to bring this one more idea to you. It's just a striking idea, and I think it goes with our issues of cowardice and courage. A nation of cowards. Listen to this statement. Courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point, which means at the point of highest reality. Pilate was merciful until it became risky. Down the page, he wrote this. The point is to keep him feeling that he has something other than the enemy. Now, this is from the screw tape letters, right? So this is C.S. Lewis writing from the standpoint of, of screw tape. Screw tape is kind of a master demon, and Wormwood is his, his he's teaching Wormwood how to be a, how to destroy souls. It's kind of a creepy plan here. But he's telling him how to cause people to be lost. And the enemy here is God the Father, you know, God, Jesus, Father, and Holy Spirit. So he says this. The point is to keep him, the, the person he's trying to cause to be lost, keep him feeling that he has something, something other than the enemy, that is other than God, and the courage the enemy supplies, that he has something else to fall back on so that what was intended to be a total commitment to duty becomes honeycombed all through with little unconscious reservations. This is from Screw Tape Letters, page 161 to 163. You heard the phrase, clever devils? Yeah. So the demon screw tape is advising his protege, Wormwood, how to lead people back to spiritual ruin. And the enemy here, describe that, it's God. Screw tape tells Wormwood to keep the person feeling that he can fall back on this measure or that measure. He wants, the devils want you to feel like, um, I've got a backup plan, right? When the government comes, I'll do this, you know, I'll do that. You know, when the signal comes, Daniel chapter 3, and we're supposed to bow down at the music, you know, at that very moment, I'm going to bow down and tie my shoes. There's a backup plan, see? That's the kind of thing the devils will cause you to think. He wants you to, to get into these, uh, to, to save yourself. He wants you to trust in your cleverness. When the government comes to my door, I'm going to do this. When the government comes to my door, I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to go camping that weekend that they're doing my neighborhood. That's the kind of way the devil wants you to, to think. It's kind of interesting the way the devil's put all this. What it, what it comes down to is trusting in our own action and cleverness. Rather, what the devils want at any time to prevent is they want to prevent us from trusting in God's help and power. We need to trust in the help and power of Jesus. But we need to understand Lewis's first line. Courage is not simply one of the virtues, but he said it was the form of every virtue at the testing point. Very interesting. At the testing point, which means at the point of highest reality. Now, wait a minute. Let's think about that. We are living in a time of test. God has shepherded heaven and earth through thousands of years to bring us to this very time. There comes a point at which the gospel itself is tested. What happens when people accept Jesus fully? What happens? What's the result? 
See, this is where God has been taking us all. What? To the point of highest reality, to use C.S. Lewis's language. We want to be heroic. We want to be faithful in much. But first, are we faithful in the least? Are we living up to all the light that we know? Are we doing what we know we ought to be doing? Are we keeping the Sabbath? Are we spending time with God daily? We'd be too busy to do that. Are we returning faithfully his tithe? Are we eating right? And maybe the most important of those, are we seeking to share our faith with others? Or are we sliding there? If everything is ultimately a test of our courage, then everything boils down to courage or cowardice. And if we fail, we are increasing not in heroism, but in cowardice. So let's be careful what we train ourselves to be. In conclusion, as we've noticed this morning, there are many things large and many things seeming to us small where we are actually being tested. Do not think all the tests come at the end. That's wrong. All the tests come on the way to the end. If we're true to Jesus today, then we're in a position to be true to Jesus tomorrow. We must not follow a crowd to do evil. Even though all the weight of argument and public opinion shouts that we are selfish opposers of the common good and that we are causing disorder. You'd better get used to it. You'd better get ready. You are going to be blamed. God's law, for example, the seventh-day Sabbath, we are to keep no matter the arguments and name-calling and force and fear and coercion that's brought to bear on us. Keep your conscience clear for Jesus. It seems likely to me that we are the generation which will be faced with this close, close test. And it may be that we need to draw closer to Jesus to be ready for that test of our love. Our nation will betray its own principles and will betray us, but we must never betray Jesus.